Wow, hallelujah. You can turn to Mark 16, guys. We will be uh, dipping in, uh, in and out of there. Uh, one of my favorite scriptures in the, the whole of the Bible. Some people argue that from verse 9 um, shouldn't be included. That's, that's a load of, um, what's the word? I don't know. I don't want to swim in church, Mike. Um, but not, yeah, it certainly should be included. And those, those verses are confirmed by the other gospel writers as well. So anyhow, shall we, um, shall we pray? Father, thank you for Jesus. Where would we be without you, Lord Jesus? Lord, we'd be lost, hopeless, and facing an eternity in hell. Jesus, thank you that you hung on that cross for six hours in unbearable pain, the height of shame, that you took the 39 lashings, that you hung there for us, that you shed your sinless, holy blood, that by your stripes we are healed. Thank you, Lord, that you called each and every one of us out of darkness, out of Satan's domain, into your glorious kingdom of light. Thank you that we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, far above all powers and principalities. Thank you that your Holy Spirit indwells us, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that no weapon forged against us or our loved ones shall prosper. And it's all because of you. Jesus, Lord, we deserve nothing. We are made worthy by your blood and your blood alone. And we thank you. And the Holy Spirit, I invite you to come and fill this room. Father, let everything that I say be of you, not of me. Thank you that we have died to Christ. Thank you that we cannot be offended because it is impossible to offend a dead man. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, would you come and do your stuff? Bring miraculous healings to this place. Set captives free. Lord, those that are in bondage to sin, set them free today like you set me free. And Father, if there's anyone in this room who does not know you fully yet as their Lord and Savior. May they leave this room in a born again, spirit-filled relationship with Jesus. And we thank you for the Gen Z generation in this place that they will see the kingdom of God unfolding in front of their very eyes not too many days from now. Father, thank you. And all God's people said, Amen. Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord? What, what else could we do on a Sunday? Yeah. I just want to re-emphasize what these guys said up there about the impact training. And to thank Mike and his team for welcoming us to Swansea to bring this. It's more than training. It's, it's life-changing. At the age of 33, I, I was on the verge of, of, of taking my own life. My then wife, and I'm not saying this in a judgmental way, I'm full of forgiveness here in my heart. But the, my then wife, my ex-wife, had, was, was sleeping with a guy 12 years younger than me. He was 21, I was 33. That was hurtful. And I had four young children from the age of three to 11 then. And it was a dark November night, November the 6th, 1993. And I was alone in my living room. 
And I was thinking, nah. I wasn't a Christian, far from it. As a little boy, my grandfather ensured that I went to Sunday school every Sunday. That was the done thing in Wales then, right? We all went. Whether we wanted to or not, I didn't really want to. I'm glad I did. And as, it was, as I was sat in that room with, I was thinking, Cocodamal or Stanley Knife, what's it to be? I'm just being real. Many of you have been there. And you need to be set free of that today. And as I was contemplating taking the Cocodamal, I wasn't brave enough to do the Stanley Knife thing. I remember getting down on my hands and knees like this. And I could remember the first four lines of the Lord's Prayer from my days in Sunday school. I hadn't been in the church for 20 years. And I went, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. I couldn't remember anymore. And then the whole room lit up. It was a dark, dark November night, 11 p.m. The whole room lit up. And a light came sort of through the window. And it hit me. I thought, wow. All thoughts of suicide disappeared in an instant. And waves of love and peace and hope and joy smothered me. And every hair on my body was tingling. Waves of electricity pouring through me. I thought, what is this? It was Jesus. Is he's faithful. When I was in Sunday school, probably about the age of 11, I remember praying a prayer saying, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And then I turned my back on him for 20 years. And he used the dire situation to pull me back. Well, I'm glad he did. Six months after being saved, I opened my Bible to 2 Timothy 4, 5. And six big, bold red letters came bursting up out of the page. It almost knocked me over. Do the work of an evangelist. I didn't even know what an evangelist was. This is 30 years ago. 27 years ago. And for the first 23 years, I tried to do the work of an evangelist in the strength of Paul. Yeah, I saw some healings. I saw some people saved. But it was all about Paul. I hadn't surrendered. I thought I had. I was looking for recognition on the big stage. One time I thought I was better than Nicky Gumbel. Pride. I had lots of deliverance, lots of demons cast out. The Lord set me beautifully free. And then in July 2019, I was in a, a conference somewhere down the south of England, and a German evangelist touched me on the forehead. And I'm not one for falling over, but I hit the deck like a sack of spuds. He didn't push me. And I had a vision. I haven't had many, but this vision was profound. And the Lord showed me that in, the third, in my third decade as a Christian, I would reap a mighty, mighty harvest of souls for Jesus. And all that's now coming true. That was July 19. In August 2020, I was in a tent mission in Cardiff, and I met an amazing man of God by the name of Jonathan Conrath. He used to work with, with Derek Prince and Don Double and David Pitchers and, and these guys. and Jonathan got up to preach. And I thought, I've got to connect with that guy. He had something that I wanted. He was a true surrendered evangelist. And I went up and spoke to him after. And I said, John, look, this is my story. And he said, oh, great. He said, I'm, I'm the founder director of a ministry called Mission 24. We're starting a school of ministry and mission in Leicester in three weeks. I was getting all excited, but he said, it's too late to sign up. I thought, ah, oh, I can't wait another year. And then he came back at me and he said, I tell you what, get a reference from your pastor. Fill in this 
disclosure and I'll take you on. I signed up for Mission 24 School of Ministry and Mission started in September 2020 and it totally changed my life. God brought me to that place of total surrender where it's no longer about Paul. I can do nothing, nothing in my own strength. It's all about Jesus. A year went by, the demand on Mission 24 was so big that it couldn't cope. So I was asked to form my own ministry, Wales Revival Alliance. My heart is to see revival come again to this great nation. And it's coming. Do you know you live in a land that has seen more revivals than any other nation? Did you know that? What happened in 1904 happened in 1904. It changed the world, but God's going to do something completely new. Wherever we go now in the world, we see pockets of revival. Blind eyes open, deaf ears unstoppered, tumorous cancers dropping off people, people getting up and walking who couldn't walk previously. I could go on. These guys will tell you. Go on our YouTube channel. You'll see miracle after miracle after miracle. And people say, wow, that's amazing. No, it's not. It's the norm in the kingdom of God. The norm. Every one of you, when you lay hands on the sick, if you're a believing believer, guess what will happen to those that are sick? They will recover. Do you believe it? Yeah. Took me a long time to. Because the church I was brought up in, the church I got saved in, in 1996, when I met this beautiful woman, She's looking at me, don't come near me. <laughs> right? She led me to Jesus. She'd been through a similar thing to me. I'm not going to unpack all that, but we met three years later. She leads me to Jesus. and I go to this church, a beautiful church, Bethel Baptist Ponticlean, beautiful church. I learned so much there. But every Sunday, they, 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 they'd have a couple of guys who had the gifts of healings. Right? I don't know if I've got the gift of healing or not. I know when I lay hands on the sick, they recover. That's another sermon. Anyway, people would come forward and they'd be prayed for. Um, okay, Jane comes forward with a, with, uh, with a back problem, a spinal problem. Jane, they lay hands on her and they say, Father God, would you please come and heal Jane's back in the name of Jesus? And then Jane goes and sits down. And a week later, Jane comes back with a bad back. And loads of people. I'm not being disrespectful. This is what was happening. And they had a, a very long prayer list. In my mother's church, the Hope Presbyterian Church in Pondiclean, they had a prayer list of about 50 names. And those names are still on that list six months later. And I'm thinking, hang on. When I read Mark chapter 16, it says in there that when you lay hands on the sick, they will recover. So why aren't these people recovering? In Bethel Baptist Church, Pondiclean. In Hope Presbyterian, Pondiclean. In all the other churches I was going to. People, I didn't see healings taking place. I'm just being honest. I'd been saved two years. And I thought, no, this is wrong. There has to be more. So then when I met the guys I told you I met, I had all these years of unlearning to do. So when somebody comes forward with deaf ears, my prayer isn't, Father God, would you please come and heal Auntie Mavis's deaf ears? No, it's in the name of Jesus, deaf ears open. Open in path, open in Jesus' name. And guess what happens? They open. And these people go running around the room rejoicing and praising the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Guys. This is for every single one of us. Not just evangelists or apostles or prophets or pastors or teachers. It's for every one of God's people in his church. If you don't believe me, read in Mark 16. Every one of us. Are you excited? You don't look it. I'm being honest. I'm not being disrespectful. I love Jesus so much. He set me free from so much stuff. You wouldn't believe the bondage that I was in. You, I'm not, I haven't got time for that now. You wouldn't believe it. I could never stand up here like this. I couldn't do it. These guys couldn't until a year ago. In Leicester last week, they seen people give their lives to Christ on the streets, left, right, and center. Patagonia. Just a few weeks ago, 600 people came and gave their lives to the Lord Jesus. 
600 people. Just the beginning. It's the same Holy Spirit in Patagonia as is in Swansea. I believe... I know this isn't going out live because I've got a lot of friends in Cardiff, but it doesn't matter. I believe that Swansea is the spiritual capital of Wales. There you are, Cardiffians, I've said it. (laughs) Cardiff is the political capital of Wales. Yes, and the Lord loves Cardiff and the Lord loves Swansea. But there is something on my heart for Swansea. There's something beating there. These guys have just been called from London to live in Eden Avenue. God's bringing his his forces into Swansea. Will you please work with us? Will you? We can't do it without you. We need you guys. Sign up. Come and work with us. Give it a go. If you can't afford it, we'll pay. It's not about the money. We just need to. Ke- we got twenty one evangelists traveling from all over the UK to be with you to take Swansea. But you need to show commitment. If you want to make an omelet. You have to take the eggs out of the box and crack them. That's a word from the Lord. Not my word, a word he had earlier when we were praying. Are you truly, and I'm addressing myself, are we truly believing believers? What do I mean by that? Mark 16 we go from verse 1. I, I'm just going to paraphrase this. Bear with me. It was early in the morning and Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome and maybe some other women went to the tomb. And you know that Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene first. She loved him so much. He cast seven demons out of it. Anybody know what it's like to be demon? Oppressed. I won't use the word possessed because that's not a good translation. But every one of you at some time or other have been tormented by demons. Some of you still are. Mary Magdalene was. To such an extent that she loved him so much. He set her free. And if you know what it's like to be in bondage, you'll understand a little bit about Mary's journey. And he appears to her first. And she goes and tell, tells the other guys, and they don't believe her. And then there's another two disciples a little bit later on, walking on the road to Emmaus, and he appears to them, and he walks with them. This is Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. And he walks with them for a while, and something is burning. Ever had that burning feeling when you're in the presence of Jesus? He just burns you. You see, he says that I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. We need the fire in Swansea, guys. It is transforming. It is life-changing. It is purifying. It sets us free from habitual sin. Their hearts burned. They went and told the others, and guess what? They didn't believe. They were unbelieving believers. Wow, it's a strong word. It applies to all of us on occasions, me included. We'll get to the exciting stuff now, don't worry. Jesus, thank you. Shortly after that, he meets with them all and he rebukes them for their disbelief and hardness of heart. And then he edifies them with these words from verse 15 onwards. Now don't forget they led him down. Peter had betrayed him three times. And he says, you go into the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's every person, including Swansea. And he said this, and those who believe and are baptized will be saved. But those who do not believe will be condemned. 
That, that's a command from our commander in chief. To go into the whole of Swansea and preach the gospel. Now you might not be gobby evangelists like me and Simon. You, may, you might be like my beautiful Julie and Eva who have got a quiet soul. But in the one-to-one -one witness on the streets, they are off the scale. That gentle one-to-one. -one. Not so long ago in Cumbran, I was on the streets with Julie and this woman comes walking forward. We don't know where she's going. She's just going about her business. And Julie has a word of knowledge for her and she says, the Lord has just said to you, do not commit suicide. And the woman burst into tears because she'd just been to the chapel of rest looking at her dead husband in, in his coffin and she was on the way to commit suicide. And she beautiful, beautifully led her to Jesus. And this woman's life was transformed. That is equally as powerful as standing on a big stage and seeing 6,000 people come running forward and giving their lives to Christ. Because he celebrates, the angels celebrate when one when one, yeah, he leaves the 99 to go after the one. Where was I? Verse 15, 16. Go into the whole world, the whole of Swansea. Can we do this together? Can we please? Let's not grieve the Holy Spirit by just sitting in our seats. Will you come with us to take Swansea for Jesus? It is so urgent, guys. Look at the signs of the times that we're living in. He's coming back. I believe sooner than we think. And then he said, goes on to say, I think it's verse 17. Oh, Jesus. And in my name, those who believe will cast out demons. So many people out there need demons to be cast out of them. So many people in the church under demonic oppression. So many of us tormented. Do you know what it's like to be free? Jesus is the one, the only one that can set us free. Yeah, he's the only one. In my name, those who believe will cast out demons. In my name, those who believe will speak with other tongues. What a beautiful gift to see five under 15-year-olds who've never been, well, four had never been in a church before, receive that gift three weeks ago when my wife, with her gentle spirit, laid hands on them, speaking in other tongues. It was beautiful. Beautiful. What a gift. Edifies us, fires us up. Do you know praise is such a powerful weapon against the schemes of the enemy? When you're feeling down in the pit, and I've been there recently, do you know the best thing to do? Get up at 3 a.m. and praise him. Lord, I praise you. I praise you. I praise you. I love you. I bless you. The enemy hates it. Praise is such a powerful weapon. Where was I? They'll cast out demons. They'll speak with other tongues. They will take up serpents. Crush demonic powers. If they drink anything deadly, it will by no means harm them. Simon mentioned earlier our, our trip to Argentina recently where we met with the, the great world-renowned revivalist Carlos Anacondia. And he unpacked this scripture about, you know, drinking anything deadly and it by no means harm them because we don't see that in any of the other Gospels. That's the only bit we don't see, by the way. And he described it as, as, as being stood on the big stage and bullets flying past him. Bullets trying to take him out. On another occasion, he went back to his hotel bed after a huge gospel campaign, got into the bed and, f and felt like a rithering and a sin. A very poisonous snake had been placed in his bed. It didn't harm him. <laughs> this is the God we serve. And then the last part of that scripture says, and when they lay hands on the sick, they will recover. Right? Not may 
recover, will recover. I'm just going to share one recent testimony in the interest of time, and then we're going to pray. Is that okay? Both call, impact training, mission, uh, July 23. Thursday night, gospel healing celebration. Lots of people came forward, give their lives to the Lord, then we the, did the normal healing stuff. One lady is too shy to come forward, so she waits till the end. And she's lost her hair through chemotherapy. She has a, you know, um, a beautiful um, scarf. Thank you, sir. On. And she comes forward sobbing, sobbing, sobbing. And she had her words, two tumors in her right breast, one 48 mil and one, I can't remember, 18 mil. And um, I got my wife up. And I said, Julie, lay hands on this lady. Julie did. And I put my hand on Julie's hand. And I said, in the name of Jesus, I command you tumors, shrivel up and go now in Jesus' name. And I stopped praying. And I said, Marie, what do you feel? And she said, nothing. They're, they're, they're still there. Now, what am I going to do about that? Didn't Jesus play, pray for a blind, blind man twice? Persistence. Expectancy, faith. How much faith do we need? A mustard seed. There's 200 mustard seeds in this room. Think what we could do for Jesus in Swansea. Think about it. Anyhow, come on, Marie, let's pray again. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke these cancerous tumors now. You shrivel up and die in Jesus' name. What do you feel? Oh, she said, the tumors are moving. I thought, ooh. Now, guess what that does to my faith level? Boop, 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 boop. The aerial's going up. Let's pray again, Marie. In the name of Jesus, Father, would you bless Marie now? I bless every part of her body. In the name of Jesus, be healed. And we stopped. And then she had a little, Julie's a nurse. So it's good to have a nurse with you or, you know, somebody medical. And those tumors had 100% completely gone. And she's been certified cancer-free. That's the God that we serve. Right? Do you believe me? Really? Do you really 100% believe me? Good, because it took me a long time to get there. <laughs> yeah, for years and years. I never saw anything like this. The occasional, you know. But you know what, guys? You know what the greatest miracle of all is? The miracle of salvation. You know when Jesus in Luke 10, he sends out the 72. In Luke 9, he sent out the big boys, the apostles. They come back, they see miracles. Then he sends out the 72. Do you know who that represents? Every one of us in this room. The ecclesia, the church. He sends them out. And they come back and they say, Lord, even the Demons submit to us in your name. Even the demons. You see, in the Old Testament, you'll see recordings of healings. You'll see recordings of resurrections from the dead. But you won't see recordings of demons being cast out. Check it out. You can say the little bit, you know, with, when David played the harp for Saul. That's, that's not deliverance. So they come back and they are amazed. Even the demons submit to us in your name. This was a new ministry. Because he is taken back from Satan. What is rightfully ours. The golden keys. The keys of the kingdom are ours. And he said, boys, don't get overexcited. That's normal stuff in the kingdom of God. Instead, rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Hallelujah. And the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's every one of us, me in particular. And then let's skip forward three chapters to Romans 6.23 where we read that the wages 
of sin is death. We all deserve death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Guys, one day we're all going to face a holy God. Every one of us will face a holy God. And if we get through the first part, then we'll be called to give an account of what we did with the talents that he's given us. How much time did we spend telling others about Jesus? In Tesco's, or if you're like me, in Lidl's. In Costa. How much time did we spend Asking that lady in front of us in the checkout queue, walking with a terrible limp, may I pray for your knee? How much time? Or do we just come to church on Sundays and maybe do the occasional alpha? That's where I was for years and years and years. And then something changed and a desperation for the lost just kept bubbling up. There's a picture of a, of a huge chasm and a fire and people walking uh, towards this fire and getting to the edge and screaming just like they screamed in the days of Noah when the flood came and then falling down into that pit of fire with Satan and his demons. That's a horrific picture. But every one of us has a divine, spirit-filled opportunity to get them to turn away from that fire and to come into a beautiful relationship with Jesus. Not everyone's called to the office of evangelist, no. But every one of us can share our faith. Can we work together to take Swansea for Jesus? Jesus.